Well, if they should listen. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome. Nice to see you here, and welcome also to everybody who is following us from in front of their screens. Uh, my name is John Steinmark. I'm responsible for the program here in the Frankfurt Pavilion, and um, I'm very much looking forward to this event. Um, is this loud? It's too loud for you? Okay. Well, uh, very much looking forward to this event, and um, I think many of us are in a time where multiple crises around the world seem to be spiraling out of control. We seek to understand, to find some, some ways of making sense of what is going on, to uh, not only understand it, but to also think about how we, how we can proceed and move on and go forward. And uh, we will have a, a three-part event today, which will begin uh, with a presentation on uh, the Global Democracy Report, giving us a sort of global perspective on um, the development of, of democratic societies and uh, rights around the world, which will be followed by a discussion on these topics uh, with a focus on authoritarian strategies and democratic resilience, followed by a panel on um, the situation in Turkey as a nation state, as a society, where uh, certain developments have taken place that I think we can uh, perhaps identify in other places as well. Um, and then actually a fourth part, which um, will be raising the question of the future of human rights. Do human rights have a future? And if so, how? So to kick off this event, it is a great honor to welcome Professor Stefan Lindberg from the University of Gothenburg and director of the WIDEM Institute, who will present the Global Democracy Report. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so, if I can get the slides on, uh, we can get going. Yes, I'm Stefan Lindberg. I'm professor of political science, but I'm also director of the VDEM Institute, which is the headquarters for the international uh, VDEM project. Uh, that involves over 4,000 scholars and other experts from 180 countries. And <clears throat> here is the Democracy Report, this year's Democracy Report, demo defiance in the face of autocratization, the opposite to democratization. Um, it's based on <clears throat> these 4,000 scholars and other experts from 180 countries providing data to us that we aggregate up in 600 indicators on democracy, human rights, media freedom, and so on and so forth. And I'm going to give you the geist of this. The report has five parts. I'm going to go through the first three uh, and some highlights from those parts. Okay? Um, where are we? At the end of 2022, what was the state of democracy in the world? Well, it's like this. The global level, if we use population-weighted measures, is back to 1986. It's the year Gorbachev um, and uh, Reagan met in Reykjavik to discuss the end of the Cold War. This is how the data looks like. So this is a liberal democracy index. You have it over there as well, but um, the black line in the middle, and then the same for the different regions of the world. And <clears throat> you can see in the last sort of 10, 15 years, there's been this back, uh, democratic backsliding. And if you draw a red line like this back, you end up in 1986. This is a measure where we take all countries in the world and their level of democracy, but we weigh it by their population size. A lot of the indices that you see here around, you only look at averages across countries. What you have to realize then is that seashells with 90,000 inhabitants weigh as much as India with 1.4 billion. But democracy is ruled by the people. 
So it matters how many people are affected by a democratic decline. So therefore, we use this population-weighted measure a lot, um, <coughs> where it, you can think of it as the average level of democracy, or the, the level of democracy enjoyed by the average global citizen. And then we're back to 1986. You can look at the same data, <coughs> but condense it into regime types instead of sort of level of democracy on an index. So these close autocracies, think Saudi Arabia or North Korea and that sort of stuff, they don't hold elections. Uh, or electoral autocracies, think Turkey that you're going to talk about later today. You hold multi-party elections, but they are not good enough. Or well, the surrounding media freedom, civil society freedom is not good enough for them to qualify as a democracy. Hmm? And then you have sort of okay democracies, electoral democracies, and then really good democracies, liberal democracies. Then the last 50 years looks like this. So you see the red line there. Maybe I should point again. The red, dark red line here, closed autocracies that were going down for a very long time, now going up again. At the same time, liberal democracies are in decline. And what happened throughout the 70s and 80s and into the 90s was that we got a lot of electoral autocracies, trying to look like democracies but not really qualifying to be that. And if you put these two types of non-democracies together, and it's now 72% of the world population live in those countries. Up from 46 just 10 years ago. That's quite a dramatic change. And it is a very dramatic change that affects all aspects of democracy. So here's a graph <coughs> with different components of democracy. So you have clean elections, but you also have freedom of association, legislative constraints on the executive, freedom of expression. This graph looks at 2012, 10 years ago, how many countries on each of these component indices were advancing, getting better in the last 10 years, and how many were getting worse. So for clean elections, 24 countries had been improving in the last 10 years, in 2012, and only eight had been declining. If you're above this diagonal line, then things are getting better in more countries than they're getting worse. Compare this now to 2022. Boom. They're almost all below the line. And worst of all out there, freedom of expression, where we also have media freedom and deliberation, the quality of debate. Think of Donald Trump as the antidote, or antithesis of deliberative democracy. Hmm? <coughs> and this shows also, now this is, you can't read this probably from where you sit, um, because the screen is so small, but these are the top indicators that, uh, the top 20 indicators that declined in the most countries in the last 10 years. Top of all there out in 47 countries, Government censorship of efforts for the, on the media. Government censorship effort. And then, if you look at it, these, among the 20, about half of them are f freedom of expression indicators. And if you extend the definition of freedom of expression to include civil society's freedom, then it's two-thirds. This is also indicating where wannabe dictators start, typically, to undermine democracy, freedom of expression, media, civil society. And it makes sense, right? If you are a wannabe dictator, let's say, John, you are a wannabe dictator, what do you do first? Shut down the ones that can scream about what you're doing, that's the media, and the ones that can get people out in the street civil society. <coughs> okay, let's look at uh, autocratizers then. We now have a historical record. 42 countries at the same time moving back 
on democracy. It's never been this many since 1900 at least. And before that, there weren't even 42 democracies, so it couldn't even happen. Here is a graph showing the data, again from 1972, so the last 50 years. The blue line here, number of countries democratizing. You see here, 70s, 80s, up, end of the Cold War, right? Woof! 71 countries at the same time. Some of us, we remember this time, right? We were happy. Everything was getting better. And then, boom, 14 by our last count. And meanwhile, the number of countries autocratizing, starting with Putin in Russia and Chavez in Venezuela, and then going up. And look at this trend now, up to 42. And imagine what happens if that trend continues. Here are the countries we're talking about right now. United States is there because of uh, Donald Trump's period and Brazil with Bolsonaro and both countries there have been turnovers. We're hoping that they turn around in terms of democracy as well. Uh, but again, in terms of the population in the world living in these countries, it's gone up from 5% to 43. 43% of the world population live in countries that are declining on democracy. <clears throat> Which ones are the worst? Here's the top 10 list you don't want to be on. Okay? In the last 10 years, the 10 countries that have autocratized the most, regardless of where they started, the decline has been the worst. Brazil, Poland, Mauritius, Hungary, India, Serbia, Tunisia, Thailand, El Salvador, and Turkey. <laughs> and never mind that the, the foreign minister of my own country, Sweden, say that Turkey is a democracy. I don't know what data they look at, but that's... But here's what I want you to notice. Um, ten years ago, all these ten countries were one form or the other of democracy. Now, seven out of ten don't qualify as a democracy anymore. That's a fatality rate of 70%. This gels with the scientific studies that we've done, looking at all episodes of autocratization in, that starts in democracies since 1900, and 77, 76% of them die. That is, there's just a statistical probability that if you are in a country that start to decline on democracy, you will survive as a democracy, is very slim. And here is one of the reasons I want to use the last few minutes talking about the relationship between disinformation, polarization, and autocratization. So what you see here is two graphs, same logic. <clears throat> Ten years ago, government spread of disinformation and then at the end of 2022, if you're above the line, things have gotten worse. There's government spread more disinformation. Same with political polarization, 2012 to 2022, above the line, it's gotten worse. Uh, and the red countries are autocratizing countries, and you see where they are. Um, and this also shows in average statistics, so here you have government spread of disinformation in autocratizing countries and democratizing countries. Goes up, goes down. Same for political polarization. Um, I think I have a slide here too. Yes. Look at this. Here's here are five of the top ten autocratizers. This is not from this year's report, from the year before. But I wanted to show it to, anyway. Indicators of polarization go up, then democracy, the red line goes down. This evidence that I just showed, and then there is a wealth of other scientific evidence, including a number of case studies on countries like Turkey, on countries like Hungary, on co countries like Philippines, India, Brazil, go down the line. 
And all this evidence together tells me, at least, and us, I think, at the Institute, a story. Wannabe dictators spread, increasingly spread, disinformation. They do that because they know it works. It works to increase polarization. Because when you reach polarization at what we call toxic levels, the high levels of polarization in society, you can start to talk about your political opponents as enemies. Enemies of who we are. Enemies of our way of life. Enemies of the nation. Because what do you do with enemies of the nation? You can start with shutting down their media and civil society organizations like Erdogan did in Turkey, then throw some of them in jail. You can outlaw some of their organizations and so on. And you will have support from the population because they are enemies of the nation. That's how it works. And we know what the slippery slope looks like in the extreme, what you do with enemies. And the wannabe dictators, they know this. This is the strategy Putin started to pursue when he came to power in Russia in 1999, and then others have copied it. That's the highlights from the first three parts of the Democracy Report. And with the main messages I wanted to convey here today, I say everything we do, the Democracy Report, all the data, everything is available on the website, transparent and so on. And on that note, let me say thank you for listening. Yes, thank you very much, Stefan, for this insightful and uh, quite bleak presentation and for providing us with some data and setting the stage for the conversations that will follow now. For the next program point, um, authoritarian aspirations and democratic resilience, let me please introduce Eva Venasse, Chris Neinerson, Ilya Trojanov, and Louis Klamroth. Thank you so much for that presentation. I wish we could start on a lighter note, but... Uh, but that's the reality of it. And uh, I want to start with something that you said in the, in the very last, uh, on your very last slide, which was um, the relationship between disinformation that leads to a higher levels of polarization and then that uh, sets the field for autocratization. Um, if in your upcoming book, um, which is based on a speech and an essay you wrote, um, you talk about a Zeitenwende and uh, and a sort of a room for discourse in in thank you in uh, in the digital era. Is that something that you see is uh, that relationship that we just saw? Is that something that is um, sort of singular to the digital realm, or is that something uh, that that leaves that digital realm and and spreads throughout societies? I think that uh, we can see already how uh, structures and uh, yeah structures of uh, social media and it, I, I would always go f f farther than social media. I think any kind of digital communication that has its particular uh, character, uh, speed, uh, anonymity, all that stuff you probably know, that that kind of uh, communication style has infected the other, the old media. Mm -hmm. So uh, you cannot differentiate anymore between, uh, because uh, digital media infects, or discussions that start off in digital media infect uh, the, the, the other normal discussions. We know, everybody knows that politicians especially, but also journalists are 
under a high press pressure that comes directly out of social media. And in many cases, you don't even know exactly where, uh, where the sources come from, or you, don't, you just lack the time to figure out where it comes from, but it's already steering up uh, a lot of anger and um, this, kind, this particular kind of binary discussions that we know so well. And can we, how can we strengthen the good sides of social media and digital discussions to, to sort of harness uh, democratic tools rather than, uh, than being used for autocratic uh, regimes? Actually, I don't know. I mean, this is, uh, I think, to, to fight the problem starts with analyzing it correctly. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I see my duty in analyzing. And of course, there's a lot of advantages that social media and digital communication um, have brought to uh, areas and regions in the world where there's a lot of pressure by authoritarian regimes. But at the same time, I would o always argue that what is a, um, a, a a gift for the one part of the world might be a poison for the other one. And I think there, that, that, it, that it is obvious how much uh, that kind of particular polarization that comes via uh, social media is already, uh, already undermining democratic structures that we have worked on for such a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, Ilya Trojanov, you are involved in uh, what is called the Global Assembly. That's an initiative that seeks uh, ideas to strengthen democracy worldwide, uh, can you explain to us what that, what the idea behind behind that is, and how and how it works practically? Yes. Good afternoon. The idea was that this city, Frankfurt, celebrated this year 175 years of the first German Parliament, and the way it's usually done, it's a kind of historical hagiography. So we celebrate the ancestors. And the idea of this large group of people and organizations coming from the civil society in Germany was to look forward and to say, it's not enough to keep on defending what we have. We have to come up with visions between practical and utopian, the whole bandwidth of visions that will not only defend institutions of democracy, but also prolong them into new forms of justice on a universal level. And to do that, we invited this year 44 activists from around the world. And the only thing we did in Frankfurt was to supply the logistical framework. And they then, in five very intense days and very gratifying days, they came up with a structure and thematic areas of concern that a larger group of people, around 100 people, will then discuss next March. So next March, 100 people from all over the world who come from the practical activist fight for human dignity, human rights, will then assemble for this global assembly in Frankfurt, discuss all these questions, and hopefully come up with different ideas, concepts, visions, resolutions, which also will be discussed in public. So during the day, they will be in an enclosed safe space in the evenings. There will be many opportunities to meet the public here. Also authors will be there from around the world who will report on this, who will then write texts uh, on this. And the interesting thing, I, I witnessed the first part of the Global Assembly this year. The interesting thing is that there's quite a large difference between the concerns that we discuss here in Europe and the c concerns of people from the Global South. How so? How so? Many of these issues that get people very excited because of the digital spaces, let's say questions of rhetorical purity, mm -hmm. are absolutely not important to people fighting for access to resources, access to the basic elements of human dignity. If you're fighting, let's say, for clean drinking water, you're not that concerned with many of the, I would say, luxury problems mm -hmm. that we're discussing in our small spaces here. And there's a certain lack of interaction between people who are concerned with these issues in the North and the people in the Global South, because they experience, even in electoral democracies, even in liberal democracies, although there are few, but even there, they experience a form of destruction of nature, a, a form of exploitation of the workforce, a form of complete disregard for the well-being and the common good of the people that is horrendous. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. and we are directly involved in this kind of, we have a imperial economic privilege that we keep on and that also very much defines the injustices of climate change that is perpetually perpetuated without us actually taking a serious look at the concerns and the needs of the people in the global south. And this is something that came up time and again in the discussion. So they were very, very interesting also, in, not only in the way they defined themes and priorities, but also in the way they put up a mirror to show us our many blind spots in, in uh, uh, regarding these concerns. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you experience uh, as well in, uh, in the World Expression Forum, that imbalance between different parts of the world? I think it's uh, important to recognize it and, uh, and uh, see to that we, we discuss it. So that's one way of looking at it. Uh, I rather prefer, though, to look at it the way like uh, Stefan has been doing, to try to not... Uh, when you look at the global situations, to see these three phases, really. The, the autocracies, the democracies, where people are working to demolish it, and the democracies where we can discuss how we can get a better way of discussing in social media. So, so we use Stefan's analysis. We even have the study of which studies are best, and I must say, <laughs> we have found that we will use Stefan's. Um, and and I, I, I think it's... If you look at it from a sort of global perspective, I've been working as a chair of the, um, uh, the Freedom to Publish Committee of the International Publishers Association for eight years. And looking back, uh, I think perhaps we've been working too much focusing on the autocracies on the, and, and all the challenges to publishers there, and not been perhaps aware enough on what is happening uh, in these countries where there is a deliberate deliberate way they have they have a recipe and you mentioned a couple of elements stuff on there and, and there, there are much more elements you can look at I know you do do that as well uh, it, it's it's such you know the, the the cookery book from Hungary from the States from Brazil from Poland and you can get very depressive but I mean hey what happened in Poland just I mean there's hope so get back to that Wexford main theme next year will be how to fight it there is a recession in in uh, the global freedom of expression we work on the freedom of expression but freedom of expression is a correlation with development of democracies as we've seen so I think that's it's the important part now is that we really have to have to fight it and you find these three different sets of uh, running countries all over the world also in the global south, also in the global north. But if uh, freedom of expression, it, there's a clear correlation obviously with autocratization, but does that work the other way around as well? So the more freedom of expression, the more uh, resilient the democracy is? You should ask Stefan. <laughs> <laughs> He's nodding. <laughs> um, if uh, that, that imbalance between different parts of the world, um, one might think that internet is a uh, balance, balancing tool to, to amplify voices from, for example, the global south to make, uh, to sort of shine a light on, uh, on those perspectives. Um, does, that, does that work that way? No, uh, entirely not. Um, we know that the, the internet has changed massively within the last 20, 25 uh, years. It was meant to be a tool for freedom of expression to give everybody everywhere the right to express his or her freedom. And it has changed very much into a, I must say, um, not, uh, of, of course, not good uh, direction. We have first, of course, the, the global players uh, who with, via their algorithms are basically controlling how apps work and they do manipulate, uh, manipulate the, the users. And of course, we have an, a huge, huge amount of misuse by authoritarian regimes, by groups that are definitely uh, made to, to undermine uh, democracy, to, to threaten people, to stalk people, to get people out of the discussion. So the internet itself might have been something neutral to connect people, but its major character is the mobilizing of masses. Mm -hmm. And 
that's why it is also so dangerous or can be such a dangerous tool to influence people in the wrong way. But it seems to me difficult to dis discuss these subjects without looking at the forms of oppression that run through the lifeline of globalized capitalism. Just to give you one example, we had a guest from Indonesia who during lunch told us, matter of fact, and it was very shocking, how in his area, the whole rainforest was des destroyed for a huge mine, lithium mine, how a huge factory was set up. People were not compensated, the, the local inhabitants, because it was a question of national interest. There's a certain economic development concept that underlines this. And in, at the end of the day, this is something that supplies our concept of ecological transformation, because this is important for e-mobility. But there's absolutely no way the people who live in Indonesia in that particular area have any instrument of fighting back against that. Because there's so many global reg regulatory uh, structures that even if there is some form of freedom of expression, if, even if it's limited, which is the fact in Indonesia, that there's no way they can actually offer a substantial resistance to these, um, to these developments. So I think we, we need to actually interrelate these different negative developments. I, I agree with that. And, um, and uh, there is actually, we're just looking at the starting study on, which has a thesis that the biggest problem to climate change is uh, freedom of expression or climate activists. So that, that might be something of what you are talking about. And, you know, I, I think that is, is an important as aspect uh, of this. Uh, but if I can just turn back to the internet, because we are, the, we are discussing a couple of <laughs> items at the same time. Uh, if you come to the, the internet and, and looking at Global South, one of our board members, uh, uh, Felicia, she's from Ghana, and she's, she's working in an uh, organization called Access Now. Mm -hmm. And that is all about how uh, the, the governments are turning internet on and off when it suits them. Uh, and, and they are really sort of monitoring it and advocating for n not being able to do that. And they are doing that. So suddenly they can just stop the channel. The second part is what you said, you know, how the channel is filled with all the face, uh, fake news. And now we're getting IAE as well. You know, how how gonna gonna, gonna fight that? <clears throat> so there's a, there's a lot of challenges here. But I, you know, if you're trying to be a little bit positive, on the other hand, it is still the possibility of reaching a lot of people if you try to use it in the best way. So I think we have to do that. We cannot just only look at the bad side of it. There, there is a lot of possibilities. But, uh, but uh, you can see uh, how, how uh, those who are trying to reduce the good democracy are using it. And, and if you, yeah, you do act uh, in, in, in uh, <coughs> South Korea and uh, <coughs> you are talking about uh, Brazil and the States, and one of the tools is really to produce different versions of the truth and make people sort of find it difficult to which one and then in the end they say you have to and, and Bolaris has said then you have to you have to look to somebody you can look to me and I can now tell you what is the truth and they have produced four or five versions of it so that's that, that there's so many ways that they, that they are using this important information information channel to make it very difficult for a citizen to be enlightened. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the major problems. Ilya, you, you once said in an interview, um, which I found striking, you said, what used to be considered utopian is today an integral part of, of a fair and democratic order. Um, I think that's a nice way of, of thinking about a democratic process, but um, looking at today's world, looking at the data that we just uh, saw, um, I wonder, is there the space in which we can think about realms of possibilities and of utopias, different versions of the future, has that gotten smaller? Well, definitely. I think we all know that we have this phenomenon of shrinking spaces, uh, both in discourse as well as in activism. I think that's a global phenomenon. I would even say that this is something that's happening in, in Germany, partly. So that is one, one aspect. Um, on the other hand, I've noticed, especially talking to people in the global south, that they also need visions. The a kind of pragmatic approach of let us just fight now for one particular issue in one particular realm is not enough. 
there has to be some kind of larger perspective which motivates people and which gives, a, gives them a sense that the next generation will have a different life, not a slightly better life. And in that sense, I think the visionary or the utopian thinking is one layer of realistic political activism. It's one necessary layer. If you don't have that, you're basically just circling around positions that have been um, acquired or defended, but you're not moving forward in any significant way. So I would always say that we need also an aspect of utopian um, political imagination and also of aesthetic uh, imagination to add to the political fights. Mm -hmm. If you were nodding, is that uh, something you, that resonates? Uh, yes, yes, definitely. But I wanted to add something mm -hmm. to, to the discussion before because our title is Authoritarian Aspirations. Yeah. And what, what do, what do uh, authoric uh, states aspire to? They want to, basically they have one wish and, and one tool. They want to differentiate groups into we and them. And it can be done so easily via digital tools mm -hmm. and means. This is what I was uh, saying before. Of course, the idea is nice that everybody can communicate with everybody in the world, but uh, we see the misuse, we see uh, uh, the aspirations of is, especially authoritarian regimes like the Russians to influence major groups uh, of opinion leaders uh, to, to, to, through these through these means, so I think we really got to talk about the um, the, the dangers that are coming from yeah. there. If you just think of Steve Bannon and his his um, uh, infamous line, which is like I think ten years old now, when he said, "Let's flood them with shit." So just flooding people with shit on the internet, with fake news, with conspiracy theories, with just shit, has, in my opinion, really established some a, a kind um, a sense of insecurity in everybody this line what is true can we still believe into anything that is a problem in Western it has become a problem in Western democracies and I think it's like in an experiment um, in a scientific experiment you can see how all these tools that were made to help us to to make our life easier and speed up our lives at the same time are up to to to make us lose uh, confidence uh, in into but democratic structures i mean yeah, we but have but we have fought uh, together uh, like 10 years ago uh, after the after this uh, NSA, snowden yeah. yeah yeah exactly we were together in a um, but, but basically what you're describing is that it's not only a danger coming from auto autocratic regimes it's also autocratic systemic instruments written into the digital world. Exactly. It's on one hand monopoly, we have five big digital players worldwide, and on the other hand, as we know now, in um, social pla uh, platforms like Facebook, certain forms of manipulation and negativity were written into the system itself. So it's, it becomes very easy then to use and misuse them regardless of the system of the regime that exists. Yeah, you have, you have the best example is this book fair. How quickly it went to postpone, this is the word that is used now, to postpone the uh, prize ceremony to the Palestinian author Adania Shibli. It took, in my uh, opinion, and I think I, I took a look into the, into the structure how this so-called so scandal uh, originated, it took two articles in a newspaper and a shitstorm on the internet, and, and it was 48 hours later the prize ceremony was gone. Um, and this is something that we are weakened by in our, in our societies, and this we should really take care of. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, I, I, well, I think we agree on the social media. I, I don't disagree with anything you have said. Concerning the, this fair, I think, um, I didn't know about the German context. It was so strong before I came here, I must admit. And I've been thinking about this quite a lot on the days after, not only the statement and that one, but also what happened at the opening ceremony when people, official people in are leaving the room when somebody is speaking. And, and as I said, I understand that there is a German context. But 
Frankfurt Book Fair is a global book fair also, and, and I have to, you have to remember that, and I don't have to comment any more on that. But uh, one thing is we've been talking about the control in social media, but I think it's important uh, to see how those who are trying to change our democracies, how the, you were talking about a couple of thing, the things, Stefan, but I think the main thing is control. Just give you one example, since I'm from the publishing industry originally. Uh, the control of the education material is a key word. A lot of these end up, they, they can be a thriving industry, competing and, and, and producing educational material for the schools. Then suddenly, a government decided there's going to be one textbook for each subject, for each age group, and we're going to make it ourselves. And, and that, you know, just think about the one thing in social media, but think kids in school every day, and they are controlled of all the information they get through the school. I think that's just one example of everything they're doing. So we need to fight on all these aspects, and we need to take it more seriously than we have done. And forms of indoctrination exist outside the question of whether there's an electoral process that might change the regime. India is a very good example. Mm -hmm. It's quite possible that one day the BJP and Modi might lose an election because they're absolutely not performing well on the economic front. At the same time, they've introduced, this is what you were talking about, this is a very good example, I believe, they introduced an, an ideology of Hindutva into the school system, into the university system, into the media, that has become so incredibly dominant that now other parties who oppose the BJP are also partly accepting this as the new reality of the way the narrative, the historical narrative of India is positioned and presented. So you have kind of underlying currents of indoctrination which are then not affected, which are paradigm shifts, paradigm shifts of looking at your own identity, which are then not affected even by regime change. And I think that's also incredibly dangerous. Very difficult then to change it. Right. I agree, and it's going to be very in interesting to watch how Tusk will use this next period in Poland to try to change some of what has been introduced, because it's always difficult to change what's been introduced. So it's going to be a pill fight, but we have to hope that he makes it. We hope, and it's difficult, but we've been talking about the authoritarian aspirations now a lot, but I want to sort of uh, try to, uh, with you guys together, think about the democratic resilience. So once there's been a paradigm shift uh, like indoctrination in the school system in India, I think is a, a, a perfect example. Uh, how do we conquer that? How do we fight that? Or is, is that a lost case? Is there the slim chance that you mentioned uh, that a, a democracy will not survive once it sort of had, uh, had a tipping point? Well, I think occasions like the global um, assembly that's, that's going to happen next March, I, I forgot to mention the date, a, a date for those of you from Frankfurt, it's between March 14th and March 18th. Can uh, everyone next year. attend? Sorry? Can everyone attend? Uh, the, the public sessions, yeah, yeah in the okay. evening and uh, Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing when you have such uh, meetings or assemblies is that you're not discussing all these questions that we're now talking about as a one issue perspective. Mm -hmm. You're actually discussing the way they're interlinked and thus there has to be both a political and ecological and an educational mm -hmm. reaction. So the thing we're discussing now, the resilience, the platforms of resilience have to be multifaceted. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, there will be absolutely no success. And this is exactly what's actually being discussed. How can you move away? Because often democratic resistance, and India is a very good example, is sparked by a certain issue. Let's say large dams, Narvada, or women rights, Kerala. And it often remains within the confines of this one issue. But making it into a larger platform with different organizations involved and different issues at play strengthens this democratic resilience to a large extent. And this is something that will be discussed and I think it's a central, integral part of what needs to be developed further. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? Yes, obviously we have to have, have that kind of vision for it, but when you then, Vexfo, we are trying to combine the activists, uh, the artists, 
uh, the publishing industry and the media industry and others interested in this. And then we have to cut the elephant in some bits sometimes and talk about you know what can we do? Because I think it, one thing is to sort of generally talk about all the challenges, but can we sort of get some best practice? Can we uh, find ways to do something? And I hope we can talk afterwards because we're at the book fair, because I think reading is so important in fighting in democracy. I'm not sure if Stefan agrees with my definition, but, but uh, I, I think that sort of what you need is enlightened citizens, and enlightened citizens who, are, who can uh, express themselves, who have access to information, and that's on th also another thing that the publishing industry with book banning and all that, um, and, and that based on that, they can make their individual choices, both, both when in election and, and otherwise. Uh, so that is sort of the ambition as I see, and, and then we have to try to see who can do what to try to keep that, and both keep it where it is on top, those who are on the top of the best list, uh, but also what can they do, those who are falling down, and well, you know, what's possible to do. So if I understand correctly, both of you are saying concepts, democratic resilience initiatives, they have to work interconnected globally on multi-perspective issues. Is that something that the internet enhances and, and sort of maybe fosters and gives us a tool to, to spread around the world? That, that's always double-sided, you know? You try to, to, to spread uh, good information, real news, and you get a, a lo load of um, fake news mm -hmm. back. Um, but I wanted to say, uh, wanted also to add something to you, what you just said about citizens and enlightened citizens. I think a problem, at least as I can see it from the German debate, is that some many institutions are not enlightened enough anymore because they give in too quickly to pressure that mostly comes from social media, from shitstorms. Um, I'm not talking again, I just gave the example of, of the prize ceremony, but you have we had so many cases of universities that took back uh, discussions or panelists or speakers because of some allegations coming from here and there. I think institutions that put up conferences, that put up discussions, they have thought about this before. So they had their re the good reasons to call this and that person onto their panel. And it should be, I think it is, it, it's, it's, it's, cowardice, it's cowardice to to, to, to cancel these things immediately because uh, here and there is a shitstorm coming up. I think institutions need really to think again uh, what their moral standards are and, and to again understand what freedom of opinion means because it means not that you are free of critique. Critique is also part of freedom of opinion and therefore um, what I've seen in the last years was uh, really cowardice of institutions and this is a first step that that this discussions and prize ceremonies and speakers must be possible if you have, have had a good reason before to put them on. And, and there's one further aspect that is not only shrinking spaces, but shrinking budgets. And this is not by chance. I mean, the whole cultural world is now being forced to save money and budgets are cut by 25%. The German government now thinks that investing in culture around the world is a bad idea. They've, the the good Institute, Goethe Institute. Mm -hmm. uh, the budgets have been cut, um, different uh, places will be shut down. Um, this is ongoing. We have a huge problem in Germany with the media, where again budgets, the fact that the budgets are lower means that number one, cultural programs have to be stopped. Now this is a completely ridiculous situation because at the same time, the national gross product has multiplied. 40 years ago, we had half of what we have today. So the nation as a whole, the economy as a whole, has produced enormous wealth, but this enormous wealth is not invested in the common good. It's not invested for society. It's not invested for culture. It's invested for growing social injustice and all sorts of oligarchical 
the first steps of an oligarchy that's visible everywhere around Europe, even in the best of democracies. And that is something we, I think, all need, whether we're publishers or authors, we all need to fight. Uh, uh, this is an ongoing onslaught against the diversity of enlightened cultural production. And uh, I think that's a major, major fight for the next few years. But is that a systemic problem um, or a systemic failure uh, rather than uh, interest groups uh, steering that process? Well, I, I think it's partly done uh, on purpose. There's a dumbing down and of course... Um, dumbing you, down, that's a, a nice dumbing, way of putting dumbing it. Dumbing down yeah. of, of <laughs> the audience. Uh -huh. And just to give you one example, when I was working on my utopian novel, I found a discussion in German radio between Adorno and Bloch, mm -hmm. eight, ten past eight in German radio, and they spoke on the highest philosophical level. Now when you're invited, and Eva knows that, you're told, please keep it short, three minutes, and don't use difficult words. That's within <laughs> one generation. Between one generation... <laughs> I was hoping you weren't uh, going to talk about political talk shows, but here we are. <laughs> uh, but is it, so, so that's a system, who, who or what is uh, sort of wants that dumbing down? Because it can't be in the interest of democratic players, surely. Well, I think if I talked about institutional problems, mm -hmm. I mean, are these, institutional, in, these institutions truly... Do they truly care about a profound democratization? Or are they in, in the realm of symbolic policies and a simulation of what they regard as a democratic theater? And we have all sorts of ongoing conflicts regarding that between people who I believe truly care about an enlightened, critical um, nation and, and people who basically are just going through the motions. There's a lot of uh, symbolism now and a lot of simulation. I, can, I could add, add another example to this when you, you, I think you just mentioned the uh, cutting down of the finances of the Goethe Institute. Uh, we as Penn Berlin, my, uh, my association that, we, that was just newly founded in uh, one year ago, we had a press statement say, on these cuttings uh, of Goethe Institute finances, uh, just saying that, okay, we understand that the money for cultural uh, institutions uh, also has to be spared, but it's always a question where you cut it down. Um, so they are uh, um, closing down Goethe Institutes in uh, um, Fr France and uh, Italy, for example, our closest neighbors that Germany is working so, uh, well together in. But uh, they did not so far cut down their headquarters in Munich, and they are huge. They are huge. I think this cannot be. Uh, this can. Th th there, there are no arguments for this way of cutting down. First, cut down at your own headquarter, and then go to uh, to Italy and France and and cut down institutes if there's nothing else to be cut uh, to, to to where you can spare money. But <laughs> I, I couldn't agree more. But you know that bureaucracy always cares for itself. First yeah, of all, yeah, exactly. <laughs> So we've been talking both about ideology and money now. So two comments. First, to the ideology. I, I think you are right that these are trying times for institutions that they need to do something with it. And I can just mention again publishing. You know, we are seeing on a global scale that more often employees say, you know, why are the publishing house I'm working for publishing that book? Uh, and we've been talking about it, and the publishers really ha have to talk to their own people and say, hey, it's not about publishing what you like, it's to publish what should be published. That's a part of it. So I think all institutions need to go through this. We are not good enough in, in, in, in this way. Secondly, the money. I'm, I'm trying to argue in, in Norway at the moment that we need to put much more money, money like we all say, in interculture. But, but I've been really been looking at the reading activities because there, there is, is a f decline in, in reading. And I'm trying to say that, that if you look at the fight we are in in Europe at the moment, all the countries in NATO are spending so much money on the defense of the countries on the borders, but nobody's talking about the defense line inside, which is culture. 
If you see in Ukraine what the Russian is doing, they're, they're not on bomb bombing physical infrastructure and trying to conquer land. They're also deliberately targeting culture, cultural object, language, everything involved in that. So it shows the importance of culture in resistance. So I said the other day when I saw how much money the Ministry of Defense came and said, could we put the culture into the Ministry of Defense so then we can three the, triple the money they will get. That could be one way of doing it. Uh, and and I'm, I really mean that, you know, reading and, and rather say literacy, this includes not only skills of reading, but, but all, everything that involves in what you get out of reading. We need to invest in that, you know. We need that, that our next generation can, can use this tool to get inspiration, to get new ideas, to get reflection. So, and, and, and our, our Prime Minister had a very, very nice uh, article in the papers a couple of months ago talking about just this. You know, reading is for democracy and for inspiration and all that. And, you know, then it came up with some extra funding like that for the cultural budget. So in, into the Ministry of Defense with culture. I, I like the idea of, uh, of culture being the internal line of defense. Uh, and uh, all of you were saying that the, the, the shrinking of spaces and decline of budgets for cultural institutions. And, um, but is it as simple as um, spending more money on, uh, on the cultural sector, on institutions, and strengthening them with money? Or is it more complicated than that? Well, I think we have to address the big question is that even in a functioning democracy, we have very little democratization of the economic spaces, mm -hmm. and that's where many of these things are decided. We, we have, of course, a way of um, a functional and utilitarian way of regarding everything. And if culture does not produce results, um, to, to give you one example, there are many different organizations looking at how successful NGO projects are. Mm -hmm. And it's a utilitarian approach, and then they would compare, for example, a project that gives out, like in Kenya, gives out $20 a month to every citizen. Compare that to a project which gives book to libraries in Ghana. It's one of the comparisons they did. And then, of course, on, on the scale that they work on scientifically, the $20, $20 um, a month per family is brilliant because it's good for the economy while reading novels at school completely useless I mean it doesn't develop the, that there's no way you can judge many of the effects of cultural development and that's one of the problems that within this system we have to fight always to justify our essential importance while I would say that telling stories is the lifeline of human existence. It's the way we define ourselves, the way we communicate, the way we interact, the way we reflect upon existence. And these things now are kind of uh, marginalized. They're not important, they're not priorities. And one of the reasons is because they cannot be well described with the instruments of normal economic uh, thinking and normal uh, analysis, what is regarded as normal. So, if I do we need new instruments to describe the usefulness of culture, of telling stories, of, of all of that, that space? I think this is with laws. I don't think we need more laws, but to, to apply them in a better way. And it's the same with culture, and this is especially uh, the same with uh, freedom of expression, freedom of arts. If we understand better or learn again what it actually means, not uh, promoting people that are of the same opinion than yourself, that, but promoting the other, the different opinions. Mm -hmm. And if we are uh, brave enough to, to have this in our country and not shrinking these, room, these rooms, as we just said, uh, then it, it can be an example for other parts uh, of the world, but at the same time, there, they don't have the freedom of expression and we have to learn it better. This, this is basically it. I think we don't need no, or I cannot think of more cultural means to, to, to, to, to improve the situation, but to look, uh, to look at what we have now. And uh, again, um, social media and digital communication, uh, communication is, is, a, is an um, 
a, a, a tool of of disinformation, disinformation that can cannot be uh, um, underestimated. Um, it, it, it, I think it is really dangerous, and it is attacking also f uh, free democracies, uh, in, uh, and it is not helping the others so far as I could. I think we agree here, Israel. But I, I think we I'm don't have to. <laughs> I, know, I, I know, but I, I think I, I would like to add. I think we need to be better to argue our cause. I think we need to be better to make connections of what we are doing, what storytelling does <laughs> for life and people and all. But we, we, we must be much better to do that and, and also put it in the broader picture. And, and as I said, I really mean it. I, in, in the fight for democracy that we have been shown is so important, we are losing. We have to put culture into that perspective and in that way say we need to get more funding. And second part, we need to be willing to look closely at how we are running the show. I think it is also important to, for us to have some open eyes on how we are doing it, uh, how we are building up the system. Can we uh, make some changes? So, like in Norway, we, we are working on a new reading strategy. The government has decided that. And, and, and some of us have been trying to say, OK, if you do a new strategy, you need to understand what you want to do. You need to understand how you should do it. And you need to look at how you're doing it now and be willing to change. We must be willing to change if we agree that, in total, that will give us a better solution. So I think we need to do something more than just saying that, Okay, like we, as I said myself as well, we only got that increase. You know, we can't. That's not enough. We have to be more mobilizing and positive. And also, we have to learn from the Norwegians because they're good <laughs> at everything. Kind of Nobel Prize, the best golf player, the best chess player, <laughs> the best uh, winter sportsman. So you must be doing something right. We'll all come and learn from you. You have to get some oil. <laughs> but but we, can, uh, we can learn from the Norwegians, maybe uh, look at a little clip uh, from your initiative uh, and uh, maybe, maybe can, uh, if we can play the clip that would be nice and then we can perhaps learn a little bit about uh, that initiative. Is that possible? Yeah. When I was coming here, I was sure that it had been um, going on for years, actually, you know, such a, such, such a brilliant initiative and such so needed for our communities across the world. The crowd that gathered here uh, at Bexpo this year has immense resource to share. So, towards victory. Please join this experience. <laughs> this is very interesting. I'm so glad I came. This is my first time I'll be here, here always <laughs> from now on. The situation for you know, freedom of expression is not great. I mean, it's, it's retreating across the world. And uh, so it's essential for people who are fighting all these battles across the world to understand that they are not alone and that there's so much that they can learn from each other across different locations and that they can be all the more stronger and more resilient when they do so. So I think this is what Rexpo is fantastic and, and very uh, important. This year's Rexpo. Five days, more than 800 participants, so many from the next generation, debating, inspiring each other, inspiring all of us, uh, sharing insights, sharing facts. This has been a great occasion, and we are so much looking forward to what happens next year. We will look at all the evaluations we will get. They will help us to improve what we are doing. See you all in the in May next year. Is, is that an invitation for everyone to come to Lillehammer next year? Oh yes, you're all welcome. <laughs> and I must say, Börsenverein is one of our shareholders, so we have close cooperation with Börsenverein as well. Um, I'm, I'm trying not to uh, have a utilitarian look at, at uh, such initiatives and conferences. Um, so the question of what's the goal of such a conference is maybe the wrong question, but what, what sort of, what's the space that you're trying to create? Yeah. Well, it's a good question. We, we are trying to do two things. The first one, to ha have a global platform for all those of us I, I was talking about previously, the activists, the artists, uh, the publishers, and the media. And also others, we're not excluding anybody. So, because 
Uh, as I said, I previously I've been working with Freedom of Expression, uh, Freedom of Publish uh, for eight years, and we have our platforms. We very seldom talk to the activists and to the artists and to the media. So, so that was one thing we wanted, and we want to have uh, both this to have try to care of the interest of everybody together, but we also do special breakout parts. So it's it's both general and targeted. The second part is that we wanted to bring in the young people into it. Because the first conference, I think it was three below 35. So we said we needed to do something. So what we did last year, we introduced a new program which we called Vext for Youth uh, Utøya, young, sorry, Vext for Young Experts Utøya. And Utøya is a place in Norway when 69 young people were killed in 2011. And, and they, have, they have turned into what they call a garage of freedom of expression. So these young people stayed there first for two and a half days, and then they came to Lillehammer and joined our conference. And we're expanding on, on this. We had 72 in that age group from 46 countries coming. And we're expanding that. We will, will be about 130 in that age group next year. Uh, and we also had the first uh, freedom of expression festivals for the local 14 to 18 years old. And we had it at the same place, at the hotel. They were messed on the outside and the inside, merging with our oldest that were talking inside as well. So we really want to bring the youth into what, what we are doing. We are, we are talking about the next generation. That's, that's a second important part of EXO. So we only existed for two years, but we are going fast. Mm -hmm. Th that's a very analog uh, um, sort of forum to discuss things. Eva, is that uh, with all the problems that you're describing also in your book uh, with internet, social media and sort of the space for debate is the way forward then to sort of um, move back and sort of have more of these uh, analog forums and discussions? I I don't know if this, uh, if this is possible anymore because the world is digitalized now. Um, but of course, it's always helpful. I mean, this is a very analog thing that we are doing here. We are, sta we are sitting here with our faces and our personalities and our real name persona, in a way, and discussing. So in, this, in that kind of sense, you, you behave differently than if you're anonymous and online. Mm. So um, if I, I would always say, um, to if, if, if digital media helps to bring p more people together to discuss, then it's used well. Mm -hmm. Ilya, so we have, we have dates next year. First, we'll go to your conference and then to Lillehammer. Yes. <laughs> so I think everybody needs to pack their bags. Mid-March, Frankfurt, mid-May, Lillama. That's what we're going to do. Thank you so much, uh, Eva, Ilya, and uh, Kristen. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Eva Menasse, Kristen Einerson, Ilya Trionov, and Louis Klamut for sharing these analyses with us helping us to make sense of the predicament we find ourselves in. Um, I can just say, you know, check out Penn Berlin, Global Assembly, World Expression Forum, support these uh, initiatives, support these organizations, so uh, we can hopefully improve our situation. While we set up the stage for the next panel, um, I would just like to tell a quick story which I think will sort of bring us full circle in a way. Uh, a few years ago, actually exactly six years ago, 2016, I was... Um, uh, Germany was the guest country at the book fair in Istanbul, in Turkey. And uh, we all remember what happened in July 2016 in Turkey and the months that followed. So uh, you can imagine it was a very, very difficult moment to go there and uh, to be there for, for the German um, guest of honor team and for German publishers and authors that went there. And uh, I was actually part of this delegation um, with the German Publishers and Booksellers Association at the time. And I met Ilya, who we just saw here on stage there actually, because we shared a cab to visit the headquarters of Chumhuriet newspaper 
the very newspaper that Jan Dunder used to be the editor-in-chief of, who we will see here in a bit. And uh, afterwards, we went to Bakikoi prison, where Asle Erdogan was imprisoned at the time. And um, Jan, I met Jan a few months later in Berlin, when we went to hand over a petition that I think more than 150,000 people had signed to the German government. Uh, we got to meet with Stefan Seibert at the time, who was the speaker of the, of the government, and, uh, and Heusken, who was the national security advisor of, of Merkel at the time, and we, we gave them, uh, handed over the petitions and, and spoke to them about the situation and uh, what's going on and what Germany is trying to do to actually help people that are persecuted there. And um, they were assuring us that they were doing all that they could. It didn't change much, we have to say. The situation in Turkey has not improved. Uh, I think it has, it has deteriorated further. And uh, unfortunately, this year there was uh, another event, which was a presidential election, where we thought maybe this is a moment where democracy could show its resilience and come back, and um, uh, we know the outcome of this election. So I think to um, yeah, discuss this and what follows from it, where we find ourselves now regarding uh, the situation in Turkey and our relationship uh, to that, I'm very much looking forward to the next panel, which by the way will be in German. So if you do not speak German, um, you can pick up uh, a headset to, to have a translation into English. And uh, yeah, I think, are we ready to ask the panel on stage? More or less, a few, I think we're just changing the glasses of water here. But um, yeah, I can already tell you who will be joining this panel, which is actually organized by Börsenverein, German Publishers of Booksellers Association, and the IG Meinungsfreiheit, which is the Freedom of Expression Working Group in Börsenverein. Um, we have, um, we'll have Beri, Beri van Eymas, who is a member of the North Westphalian uh, Parliament for the Green Party. Jan Dünder will be here, as I mentioned already. Oliver Meyer Rüth, Turkey correspondent for ARD. And uh, the panel will be moderated by Özlem Zarikaya. So thank you very much for your attention.
rot -Eigen. Liebe Gäste, im Namen der IG Dear guests, on behalf of IG Meinungsfreiheit of the German uh, uh, Publishers and Booksellers Association, I would like to welcome you very warm-heartedly. This panel discussion takes also place within the framework of the Hessische Broadcasting Station and will be recorded and streamed. Last year in May, we have started discussion rounds focusing the freedom of expression and other um, groups. I would like to welcome the member of the North Rhine-Westphalian Parliament, Beri van Eimers. A warm welcome to you. A warm welcome goes to the journalist and author, Oliver Meyer Rüth. I know you from the uh, publishing offices of the Bavarian uh, Broadcasting Station. And I would like to welcome Can Dünder, the Turkish journalist and author in exile. It's good to have you all here. Can Dündar, I would like to start with you. The presidency and the parliamentary elections in May this year, they were designated as an election of destiny. And Erdogan went, uh, uh, was re-elected and you went into exile before, but it means that you have to stay here even for a longer time because of the re-election of Erdogan. You have re published this new book, Die Rissige Brücke über den Bosporus, and you described the electoral night, and there were five phases of mourning after the results, and the last phase was accepting it. But what was it that you have to accept, that you had to stay in Germany, that he's more powerful and strong than you would have thought? What do you mean by accepting it? I'm sorry, the uh, translation will follow soon. Within a couple of minutes, consecutive interpretation will follow. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for this question. It was not the first election I or we lost. I've actually spent my whole life losing this fight for the people who believe in democracy, who live in Turkey. Uh, for them, it was a real life situation, an everyday life situation. But there was something new in it. So what is new and what is new for me personally is indeed the fact that I will have to keep living in exile. But what does it mean for Turkey? It is that a feeling has come up that we have started to ask ourselves the question, will we ever be able to win an election? Was it the last election where we saw the opportunities to win? Will we ever be able to win? And this upcoming feeling 
means uh, danger. There are many examples of autocracies the world over that go along with elections. Elections take place and it, look like, it looks like the population goes to give their vote, but actually it is set up and structured in a way that the old system will only be protected. In such a situation, you just cannot win. And the elections are like a show. And unfortunately, we have seen this in Turkey and it applies to the regime. And this is a very dangerous thing. Of course, we have to accept the result of the elections, but we will never accept that we were defeated. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Iver, you are a deputy of the um, State Parliament in North Rhine-Westphalia, Vice President, uh, Spokesperson of the uh, Green uh, Group in Europe, and uh, Turkish nationalists um, berated you as anti-Turkish, enemy of Turkey, or uh, sympathizing with PKK. Turkey, the country where you were born, what does it mean to you today? Uh, is it a lost, con lost state or is it a country um, worth fighting for in terms of its democracy? I think it's always worth fighting for democracy uh, everywhere. Never must there be a state, a country or a nation be declared lost. And this is also a mandate for politicians to make sure democratic politicians, European and also German politicians, to support democratic, democratic forces and to make sure that they can continue with their work and that grievances, um, as we can see them now in Turkey, uh, can be uh, addressed actively, not just addressed, but everything should be done so that these grievances and problems Cannot be, should not be just accepted by real politicians. Uh, we know uh, certainly since uh, the um, aggressive war of Putin against Ukraine, any autocratic regime is also a risk for us, a danger for our freedom and danger for our security. And for individuals like myself, it also means that we have to live with um, hate speech and uh, similar um, um, offensive um, words against us in Germany. You've just heard uh, Mr. Um, Dunda say that this was, may have been the last election in Turkey which had an open end uh, where it wasn't clear who, was, who would win. Do you also do you agree? Well, despite this um, really depressive starting point we are in at the moment after these elections. I try and keeping up my hopes, I'm tr I'm trying to keep up my hopes, but for this to happen, there must be some fundamental change, uh, which includes, for example, the conflict, uh, the Turkish Kurdish conflict, which has been simmering for decades. I think this is a, a crucial lever. If we take a look at the last few years in Turkey, we can see that in around the 2000s, 
2009-2010, Turkey has seen flourish, a flourish, flourishing of democratic trends. Um, this was the high time of democracy. LGBT people took to the streets, and we and also were out in the streets. And we have seen that Istanbul has a huge queer movement, the women's rights movement, the feminist movement, which, by the way. Uh, has seen Jinjan Azadi on the streets of Istanbul. Uh, they still go out to the streets and demonstrate and to the t tens of thousands, even though they are um, beaten up regularly. But the reason why uh, there was such a fruition of the civil society in the two th in 2009-2010 was that we had um, had peace talks to some some kind of peace talks with an organizational structure which uh, talks with a terrorist organization, PKK, but these peace talks are decisive for, to call an end to this armed conflict, this war. And these t peace talks alone have shown that in, there is a population who are open for peace, who are not as um, um, at loggerheads, as you uh, would imagine, uh, with each other, and who really have lots of resources in civil society, too. Oliver Meyer Ruth, uh, last time you uh, went uh, to Turkey for seven years and you presented the ARD um, studio there, and you also wrote a book about this, which was published in spring. Uh, the um, omnipotent, uh, um, the omnipotent person, of course, or omnipotent is only God. So, would you call Erdogan as a kind of God or a prophet, or how d is was your reading of this title? Well, this is my book, as you can see, and you also see that there's a question mark behind it. So, of course, he's not God. Um, it's a question of perspective. His followers, of course, uh, say, think he's great, and there's no doubt at, at all about the fact that they will re-elect him, they, um, vote f for him again. But you have also seen the re election results, which was quite uh, close. And I'd like to make uh, give Chan Dunda a little bit of hope. I have always perceived ter the Turks as a nation who want to have participation um, by all means, uh, the results in terms of the, um, the voter turnout was excellent. It was nearly 90 percent, and we can only dream of it here in Germany. So they, uh, if you had uh, the right candidate, I think there is a good chance that the opposition could win the elections, elections in Turkey. And I also said so in my book. Um, and said so before the election. Mr. Kilic Daoulu wasn't the uh, right candidate. One reason was that Erdogan, well, his um, politics became a more, more and more nationalist. He would have joined um, uh, an alliance with the right, extreme right party, um, ATP, and uh, his, la his language, his wording was also be always also became more nationalist, and this, of course, ha seeps into society. Nationalism is is anyway a different issue in Turkey than in Germany, and has been for decades. You should know this. Kilic Daoulu is an Alevite, and uh, the, of course, there are people that argue as to whether this could be put up in a reason. I've talked to lots of conservative Turks and said yes, that's certainly relevant for me too. So I think if you find the right kind of a candidate, you can win against um, Erdogan, but that's not easy because what he has achieved in recent years, it he has brought the media under his control. There are a few media, great journalists who try and uh, put up some resistance there, but there's always the risk that they could be um, locked up. But he has the media under his control, and that's of course an important factor in the elections to create a kind of mood in a country so that you present yourself as the omnipotent. Well, many people regard him, uh, well, as you say, there's, there's God, then there's Mohammed, and then there's his name uh, mentioned quite frequently. So this uh, title isn't all wrong. Th this. Um, 
sort of sanctifying Mr. Erdogan. Well, if you uh, if he's on on a move in, for example, in his uh, neighborhood or amongst people who are supporters of him, they really glorify him. They sometimes tr start crying and kiss his hands, and they tr seek proximity with him and he's also a man of the people he is a populist and he exploits that he's he's taken a bath in the in the, in the crowd and uh, they really do glorify him he also describe as, as to how he uses mimics and gestures and how he's very proficient in that and also that he uh, makes it appear to the outside as if you were uh, bowing to him and you yourself um, fell into this trap, uh, um, which is very uh, uh, revealing to read. Chan Dunda, we keep talking about uh, limited or lacking uh, freedom of expression, freedom of the press in Turkey. What was the situation like before the uh, Erdogan era? Türkiye basını hiçbir zaman bir cennette yaşamadı. Yani hiçbir zaman biz özgür, ben 40 yılı aşkın süredir gazeteciyim. Özgür olduğum bir dönemi hatırlamıyorum. Ee, okuduğum kadarıyla benden önce de durum farklı değilmiş. Onun için çok yeni bir şey değil ama baskının bu kadar yoğunlaştığı bir dönemi de hatırlamıyorum. Yani askeri yönetim dönemlerinde de gazetecilik yaptım. Bu kadar kıstırıldığımızı hatırlamıyorum. Biraz önceki şeyimi biraz ara vereyim. Well, the press in Turkey has never uh, lived in paradise, I can vouch for that, because more, for more than 40 years I have been a journalist, and I could not say that I was never, I, I could say that I was never completely free. The situation before Erdogan wasn't all that different. We always felt the pressure, but it was never as strong and as bad as it's now. I was a journalist at the time when we had a military government after the coup, and even at that time, the pressure wasn't as high as it is now. Um, I would also like to briefly mention uh, why I am losing hope, although I am an optimistic person by nature and I'm becoming more pessimist. There are various reasons for that, and one certain one reason is that Erdogan has nearly complete control over the media now and on top of that, we have his control over the judiciary. So you can't use a legal system against him. And the fact that he controls the media also means that he has um, command of a very strong propaganda machine. The best example is that he selected his own competitor in this election. Um, you're right, maybe um, this wasn't the right candidate uh, against Erdogan. The best candidate would have been Imam Onu. But what did he do? He turned to the judiciary and gave instructions. Then some investigations were started against Imam Onu, and he could not um, run against him, against Erdogan.
on top of this, we have to say this is a f there is a new Islam Islamic Islamist generation uh, in Turkey which is now occupying important positions in the country and that's also one reason why um, I'm becoming less and less hopeful and the third reason is that many uh, modern thinking democratic democracy loving people in Turkey are leaving uh, Turkey in, in their droves uh, many of them coming to Germany which is a big loss and which makes me less optimistic about Turkey and the fourth reason is the global climate the populism globally is on the rise and we can see a loss of democratic values and that's another reason which um, suggests to me that Erdogan is here to stay. Well, you write oftentimes that the Western world apparently does not want to have a different president of Turkey and that the Western world is always supporting Erdogan by, for instance, if you are in the country, no one, never do they have a meeting with the opposition party members. So what is the interest of the Western countries, of the Western world, that Erdogan stays in power? What was their interest to keep him in power? I would like to give you a very simple example. Just think about uh, the many, many refugees. And they have money, countries have money, and they would like to stop the refugees. But they only have the money. That's their only power. And there is a president of a republic very interested in the money. And they say, I give you 3 billion euros to stop this influx this stream of refugees and I don't have to underline it or mention it the journalists or the politicians are in prison in Turkey it is indeed a very successful deal so we talk about 4 million refugees in Turkey and Germany at least the political um, government no longer talks about freedom of press and freedom of opinion in Turkey. And if the opposition in Turkey would have won, if they had won every time when Olaf Scholz would have traveled to Turkey, there would have been six different heads of political parties to negotiate. So that would have made, would have made uh, would have made life more difficult. So not very good for him, for Olaf Scholz. As you just said, the general atmosphere in Turkey in the year 2019. So at the time, we had a very strong queer community who was loud, who was free, who moved freely. 
So what did the Western world in this moment um, stopped to do? So there was a great mood in Turkey and the Western world just forgot to do something. There was a tipping point. Yes, this mood was not started via the wonderful Gezi protest. It was um, not independent of the peace talks we had. That was a time when a lot of people talked about a solution of the Kurdish question. It was a time when, for the first time in Turkey, international conferences concerning uh, the genocide of the Armenian people was discussed. So the taboo topics that led to a situation where Turkey is where it stands today in these countries were started. And I think it is really the European politicians, Europe, who just missed the momentum. They didn't make good use of the momentum of giving a perspective for the Kurdish question. And also the peace talks, to stabilize the peace talks, and especially in the, in the Far East. Is the Israeli war and the bloody attack of the Hamas. So we see what a difficult consequence we see of a conflict. It's difficult for the whole peace order. If you simply say, let's just uh, let conflicts run, you can't. And that's why I hope that the current situation in the world and the many conflicts we have around the world where people just don't respect international law, that this will lead to an opportunity in order to change one's way of thinking. And as Mr. Maya Ruth said, well, Turkey was always a nationalist state. That was a little aside remark. No, it's not only an aside remark, but one has to double check this problem, the core of this problem. We have to say no. Being nationalist means being nationalist. Nationalism never ever is supposed to become the mainstream. And this nationalism that we've seen since the foundation of the Turkish Republic is responsible for the situation that Turkey is where it stands today. The autocratic situation we currently see and the biggest opposition party, JHP, they were not successful in winning these elections. Had very little to do with Kilic Tarolo, I think, but with the mere fact that the biggest opposition party, GHP, was not able to come up with an alternative concept and to articulate and to say this is the type of politics of violence and of war. We have a concept of peace. So this Islam or nationalism, and we have a different concept of liberal democracy against the concept of despising human beings. We have this policy where we say we're not against the refugees as they're currently doing it. And for the opposition, it didn't work out. And had it worked out, then I don't know whether Turkey would be in a better situation now. But you said yourself, nationalism is not new, not 100 years old, maybe 100 years old at least, and CHP now is something where we see nationalism with CHP and other political parties they represented too. So you can't stop this overnight. You can't switch off nationalism overnight. Well, it's just been a while. We talk as if Turkey has always been in the situation where it is today. Just remember, back in 2015, Erdogan and AKP lost an election. And this current situation in the year 2015, we lost the election because we had this dynamic civil society and the peace talks. And the Kurdish opposition party, HDP, won 13 percent and entered the parliament, won seats in the parliament, and was able to have an impact on decisions in the parliament and helped to have a new human rights-oriented Turkey that was a perspective. And now, 
chairman of the HDP since 2016, is in prison. The European Court for Human Rights have told them a couple of times that this is just a political imprisonment and nothing happens. And that's fatal, that's bad. And one has to say, this is our responsibility, also when we deal with European understanding of human rights. Oliver, we have a politician who keeps saying, my goal is to become a member of the European Union. So this is what he says. But indeed, as um, Mrs. Aima said, but they ignore um, judgments by the European Court of Human Rights. So this shows his power in comparison to the power that Europe has. There was a time when Erdogan thought it is advantageous if a Turkey were a member of the European Union. And this time is over, I think. We have all types of surveys in Turkey. It deals with nationalism, by the way, not only the Sunni nationalism and Turkish nationalism. In Turkey, there is also Kurdish nationalism. And all these things only work if you always have an enemy, if you keep this enmity up. So what I think is he understood after the surveys that we have this mood, this atmosphere, and we said the European Union always said, well, one day it'll work out, and they never kept their promise. So people in the country say in Turkey, we don't need the European Union anymore. We can handle everything ourselves. And I think then again, there is this conviction within the European Union that Turkey right now is something is a country we do simply do not see within the European Union. It has to do with Erdogan, with the geo strategy, because we think that Turkey really is the country between the European Union and countries like Syria, Iraq, Iran. And in Turkey we have a lot of refugees at the moment. And in those seven years, I thought it's a big challenge for the country. How do they handle it? So respect. Just imagine the discussions we have right now in our country. And this topic with the European Union, I think they understood that this is over. And Brussels, Berlin, and politicians simply have to think about it. So if we cannot promise EU membership, we have to do something else. And um, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz was mentioned. Well, in March 2022, he visited Ankara, and I attended the press conference. And then he talked like 30 minutes about economic relations. And nobody talked about human rights only when he was asked specifically. Then we talked about freedom of the press. And then we said, how about Deutsche Welle in Turkey? Very important program. These broadcaster Deutsche Welle, who did a great program in Turkish, in the Turkish language. And Deutsche Welle is owned by the German federal government. And he didn't really want to say something. He said, we'll look into it. And on the 1st July of 2022, the German uh, Deutsche Welle in Turkey was discontinued, stopped. So how do you handle this authoritarian leader? They have to have a plan in the long run. And that's missing in Germany. That's what I thought. And also thought um, in the German Foreign Service, they do not really know what they want to do with Turkey in the long run. And the plan to be a political observer, is it uh, to show him the cold shoulder or offer him a handshake? Both. It depends, really. Well, it depends. What do we want? What do we want uh, to promote with Turkey on the one hand? And where do, have, where do we have to tell Erdogan that there are limits to what he's doing? It's not only about economic relations. We have 7,000 German companies in Turkey, and it looks like they earn good money. And as I always heard in Turkey from German managing directors, Turkey is a side where it's worthwhile to invest. People work a lot. They want to learn. They want to work hard. That's good for a German company. But it's not only about the economy. It's about human rights. It's about democracy. So one has to exercise more pressure and have a clear language. So for the German government, 
Mr. Scholz, I don't know, he wasn't very clear what he said. Uh, Annalena Baerbock was there, so she talked a little bit with Shavu Sholo, the foreign minister of Turkey, but there was just talks on an open stage. What did Angela Merkel do? Similar. Similar. Frau Merkel did the deal about the refugees because then she was she calmed down in 2015. Refugees were a big topic. Then she gave Erdogan uh, the opportunity to react and... I would like to add something, because I'm personally involved. It's a personal anecdote. As you know, you mentioned the press conference with Olaf Scholz. At the time, I remember Angela Merkel's press conference. I saw it, watched it on TV in my prison cell. And at one point, a journalist dared to ask this question. And he reminded him of the journalists in prison and said, would you like to say something about it? You, Angela Merkel, would you like to say something about journalists in prison? And she says, she said, we talked about it with the prime minister. He should answer. So she put the ball in his court. And from Turkey, Turkish side said there are no journalists in prison in Turkey. And in this very moment in my prison cell, alone in front of TV, I screamed. I screamed, I am here in my prison cell, imprisoned. Nobody heard me. I was in my prison cell and there was only my TV apart from myself. So if Erdogan has this power, if you give him this power, it'll come back. Do you know who asked the question in the press conference? It was Dennis Yücel. And one year later, as you remember, he was in prison in Turkey himself. So if you do not react, if you do not interfere, it'll happen. And it happened even worse than before. Chandunda, you just said, if you ask courageous questions, either you lose your accreditation as a journalist, you cannot attend the press conferences anymore, or you will end up in prison yourself. Or in your case, some nationalists or people shoot you, try to shoot you. There was one case where some people uh, tried to do some uh, self-justice but we still see these people, the many, many courageous journalists, media, publishing houses, and human rights activists. What do you, what do they expect from us? Is it naive to ask what can we do? Gerçekten haklısınız. Yani insanlar canı pahasına demokrasiyi savunuyor Türkiye'de. Bu sözün gelişi değil çünkü çok ağır bedeller ödülüyor ve insanların canını kaybeden insanlar var bu yolda. Şunu görmeniz lazım. Sizin Katar'la es sıkışmanız, 
Katar'da birçok insanın canına mal oluyor. Sizin Erdoğan'la el sıkışmanız Türkiye'de birçok insanın hapse girmesine yol açıyor. Sizin demokrasiden vereceğiniz her taviz, siz derken genelde Avrupa'yı, özellikle Almanya'yı kastediyorum. Demokrasiden verdiğiniz her ta taviz dünyanın bir yerinde insanların daha çok acı çekmesine yol açıyor. Tek çaresi var, demokrasiyi savunanların yanında durmak, onlara destek vermek ve otokrasiye karşı durmak. Bunu yapmadığınız sürece dünyanın kalanı acı çekmeye devam edecek. Well, you are right. They are right. The courageous people who keep defending democracy, putting their lives at risk. They pay a high price for what they support. That you can see that if they stretch out their hand to Qatar, people will be dead in Qatar. They will stretch out their hand to Turkey, and then Erdogan will make sure that people go into prison. And every time you make sacrifices to democracy someplace in the world, it means that people will have to suffer more. This is why we have to protect the people who support democracy, who fight autocracies. We have to support them until the end. We have to be on their sides. Can you please tell us how? Well, with regard to um, with regard as to how we can support them, it really depends on which government you talk about, because the government will only act in their own interested interest, just like the capital. My hope is into the civil goes to the civil society, the people, because just as Mrs. Imas has said before, the women's movement is very strong in Turkey, and I would wish that the German uh, women's movement would cooperate with the Turkish women's movement. So it would be good if the German and Turkish movements came together and worked together. I would like this cooperation in the trade union sector, for the universities, for the journalists' associations, not only relating to Turkey, but pertaining uh, to a global level. I would wish the civil society organizations would cooperate. I can see that Orban learns from Erdogan. Erdogan learns from Putin. They cooperate. They act together. 
but we are many more and we are stronger. If we would only learn to cooperate more closely, to collaborate more, then we would achieve more. Beriman Aymas, you are a policymaker, a politician, and you heard that Can Dündar doesn't seem to believe, actually, that Turkey, together with, um, well, that he can be, let's say, one with the help of European policymaking. What are you saying about this? Because you are a strong fighter. You were... Um, you were there, you were present, you had to support and to bear with the offenses, and you are also in the middle of this. I think it is important that we keep up our trust in our democratic governments, and we have to talk with um, everyone here. Real policy making works differently than the policy from the streets from which I come from. I have grown up in the um, culture of protesting, and I think that the close cooperation of real policy making together with working with the civil societies will develop the real power that we need in dealing with autocracies. And this also means if the foreign minister um, dares to discuss with Chavuculu from Turkey in front of an audience of international journalists and um, auditors, then, uh, and if she has the courage to speak out, it has to be validated, it has to be appreciated, and not like just, ah, they just talk on the stage, but it is very courageous by her. A lot is uh, coming up here. It is very, um, it, it needs to be appreciated that the bombardment of Rojava in the north of Syria is against international uh, law. And this is very important that someone dares to pronounce this, to formulate these words. And it has to be, again, appreciated by also by the civil society that only the cooperation here will bring results. And we are celebrating 75 years of the book fair. It's an anniversary and it's 75 years of human rights of the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights. And I think it is very important that everywhere we will stand our grounds as politicians, authors, um, as TV presenters, that we raise our voices, that we make sure that human rights are non-negotiable, that human rights are not uh, are not ambiguous, that we need to be precise here. Can I just ask you back? We heard that there are two, um, there were two different opinions that the Court of Human Rights will make um, sentences and we see that the German foreign minister stands up and tries to find clear words, but the Court of Human Rights sometimes makes sentences where dictators or other uh, politicians will be favored. Is that not ironic? Should there not be done more? Should there not be more? Uh, in defense of human rights. Yes, of course, we need to do more here. Otherwise, we would not sit here. Very specifically, for example, I believe we are, there are so many people imprisoned in Turkey, journalists, authors, people who do culture, create culture, politicians who were forced to resign, Lord mayors, parliamentary members, and two things are very symbolic here. First, the person, the Selatin Demirtas, the HDP president, and then second, the former one and the second person. She is a culture, uh, she works in culture, created culture, and these two persons, they are imprisoned. They will not be released. And I think the release of these two persons 
these two very symbolic names are could be the foundation for a talks and a possible collaboration between Turkey. And it can be done. There are numerous funds that go to Turkey via EU programs. So at least we it is not about blocking or banning the uh, Turkey's accession uh, or um, entry into the EU, but for example, that um, they have to simply release these two persons that are imprisoned in order to conduct other talks and that the funds will be stopped. Of course, it was about Eastern Mankavala uh, in this discussion between Chavuchovulu and Annalena Berkok. I was quite um, annoyed by this. Baerbock was using the political stage here also in order to, well, be favored in her own political party, but you can do more. For example, look at Dennis Jugel. He was imprisoned and Sigmar Gabriel, German politician, stopped the Hermes uh, credit funding to, towards Turkey. So he was really acting. And this is something what I expect. I expect more from the German federal government than just simply words, a political debate. <laughs> Eminim Osman Kavala da hapishanede çok hayranlıkla izlemiştir. Benden farklı olarak burada daha e, eleştirel bir dışişleri bakanı gördük. Almanya etkili gördük. Ama hapistekinin durumu değişmedi. Hapisteki gene hapiste. Sadece Almanya'nın biraz daha sert bir söyleme döndüğünü gördük. Ama sonuç alması için yüzde yüz katılıyorum. Bunun koşul hale getirilmesi lazım. Avrupa İnsan Hakları Mahkemesi niye var Türkiye uymayacaksa? Ve uymayınca bir yaptırımı yoksa buradan hiçbir yere gidemeyiz ki. Yani çünkü ticari çıkarlar var, siyasi beklentiler var. O yüzden buna göz yumuluyor açıkçası. Almanya buna göz yummayı bitirdiği gün Türkiye biraz daha ciddiye alacak bu eleştirileri. Ich habe die besagte Pressekonferenz zwischen den, äh, den, der Außenministerin Baerbock eigentlich mit Bewunderung äh, mir angeschaut und ich bin mir sicher, Osman Kamala hat das mit seinem Fernseher in seiner Zelle das ebenso getan, also mit Bewunderung. Äh, das ist schön zu sehen, dass eine kritischere Außenministerin äh, Deutschland auf dieser Bühne auf die Art und Weise vertritt. Aber das Ergebnis bleibt gleich. Also der Inhaftierte, der sitzt immer noch in seiner Zelle. Und deswegen bin ich absolut äh, der Meinung mit Ihnen, es muss zu einer Bedingung gemacht werden. Also wenn, warum gibt es überhaupt äh, den Gerichtshof für Menschenrechte, wenn äh, die Türkei das Urteil überhaupt nicht akzeptiert? Es, gibt, es geht immer um äh, eben wirtschaftliche Interessen und politische Erwartungen. Und solange man die in den Vordergrund steht und viele Dinge, von vielen Dingen wegschaut, dann wird die Türkei eben eine deutsche Politik und Deutschland nicht ernst nehmen. Erst wenn man sich das ändert, wird die Türkei das auch ernst nehmen. Wir sind am Ende. Ich möchte aber eine ganz, ganz, ganz kurze, wir haben, glaube ich, Zwei Minuten noch exakt. Ähm, äh, eine kurze Frage an Sie stellen mit einem Zitat von, aus dem Buch von Jan Dündar. Äh, an einer Stelle heißt es... I'm sorry, the microphone was off. So this book from Jan Dündar was um, in German auf den Punkt gebracht. He says that um, poverty, repressions and hopelessness, a brain drain was taking place in Turkey. And on the other hand, a generation has grown up during the past 20 years that sees fanatic people and they went to school and they were not brought up to question things, but to be obedient. Uh, so this is uh, your statement. Can you please tell us how do we do it as um, if we don't want to lose the younger generation? I was asked 
many times. During these tense times, is it advisable to travel into Turkey? And I only have to tell them, but I live there. I can only recommend people to go there, to exchange ideas with people and to seek to conduct talks with them. It's not over. Everything is going on. And the percentage of people with Turkish roots is so high in Germany. We live together with them. We have to come together and talk. It must not end. It must not stop. Berivan Aymas, what do you say about this? We, how can we uh, not lose Turkey? Well, if we are very clear in our position and stay towards our partners in Turkey, that we have certain principles in our relationship that it is about keeping up human rights, liberty rights, plurality must be granted. And all of this at the condition of a partnership relation. Otherwise, the partnership can be stopped. This is the clear compass we want to pass to Turkey. And the forces in Turkey, the civil democratic societies, the um, Turkish women movements and other movements, we have to tell them that we protect them and that we seek to end the repressions against you. If there's one chance, Chandundar, not to lose Turkey, what would be this chance? How can we find it? But because we need Turkey also from geostrategic reasons. Turkey's strength is that 50% of the population continues, and even after 20 years of repressive policy making uh, by Erdogan, that they say continue, that they continue to say no. So we have the potential, and this potential needs sovereignty. It needs our support our solidarity and it, during election night we the 50 percent were very sad but also very proud because almost 50 percent of the population of the country continued to say no the next morning however we learned that Erdogan was congratulated for his uh, winning the election that he was invited to germany germany but at the same time, not a single sentence was uttered in order to support the ones who advocate democracy in Turkey. And if such a sentence will be formulated, worded at such a high level, then we are able to not lose Turkey. Thank you so much. It is a very difficult situation, but we have a a light of hope here, a beam of hope, and we will not give in. Thank you very much to the people here at the panel, and I would like to thank the audience for their attention as well. And I would like to thank the uh, interpreters for their good services. Thank you very much.
So, hallo, hallo. Nochmal ein herzliches Dankeschön an äh, die IG Meinungsfreiheit im Börsenverein, die dieses wirklich... Äh hallo again and thank you very much to the IG Meinungsfreiheit for organizing this panel. I would like to thank all of the previous panelists who were here in... Uh, Despite all the difficulties we saw, we uh, ended on a positive note. Jan Dündar said, hope is there. The next panel which will take place after a short rearrangement of the stage will uh, follow up on this. We will ask, what is the future of human rights? Do they have a future at all? And we are looking forward to welcome Professor Irina Sherbakova, who works for Memorial. She is a historian and human rights activist, and also Professor Michel Friedmann, philosopher and publicist. And the moderator will be Luis Klamroth again. Thank you for your attention. We will continue in a moment. So, jetzt ist es an. Schön, dass ihr It's good to have you all here. We talk about the future of human rights. And of course, human rights are questions at the questions at the moment everywhere in the world. We speak against the background of a large Russian aggressive war on the Ukraine and also we talk against the background of the Hamas attack on Israel. Mrs. Sherbakova now, against this background, it almost seems cynical to ask the universal human rights, are they not just a mere facade in the face of all these crisis spots in the world? No, it, it cannot be just a facade because they are universal. These are the basic human rights to be alive to live the, your life the way you want to, to be free and not be under a violent government. What we see at the moment, of course, is a terrible attack on the universal human rights. Why do you ask this question? Well, of course, the organizations and the countries have to ensure that they will be kept. And they are in a state of crisis, an absolute crisis, and we are all aware of this. A very terrible uh, joke is going on. You cannot even call it a joke, but it is, uh, it's, uh, I am perceiving it. I am worried, but I don't think of anything, actually. So I'm like the United Nations. So this is the terrible, not really joke. I think 
that the world's peace order is questioned because, yes, you just cannot get a grasp of it. And what we are seeing today is an attack, in particular, an attack at the universal human rights, on the universal human rights. And for too much time, it was accepted in a careless way that Putin has become a dictator who can attack the Ukraine and start this terrible war. We, from our weak powers in Russia, we wanted to set a warning sign. We wanted to warn the world, but it didn't work. And now we are faced with the facts and, and have to think about it. What will, be, what will come out of it? How can we restore things? Mr. Friedman, you are well known for asking the best questions in this country. And last year, you asked Professor Heiner Bielefeld a question I want to put to you now. Are human rights a hopeless promise? No, but a promise. And a promise has to become reality, or it will simply dissolve into disappointment, because we are existentially relying on this promise. Hannah Arendt answered the question for human rights in her own special way when she was fleeing, but also afterwards in a very fundamental way. She talked about the right to have rights. And so you ask, what is new about this? Up until then, people had rights. They had a parliament, a majority, a group, and um, gave them the rights, whichever rights. But later, another power withdraw the rights from them. So this is was an incredible civilized way of thinking, which took play over two to three hundred years in the face of enlightenment and was densified in the question of humanity that you say it is a right to have rights is not questionable, is not debatable. You cannot withdraw my rights. It is an a priori right. The human being himself has the right to have rights and we are born like this. The trouble is that in dictatorships, it is not regarded as important because it is the contradiction of the dictator's right of existence and the democracies that have agreed on this. And by the way, it is constitutional in the UN's Declaration of Human Rights, and every country subscribes to them. The UN is, in the end, is. Uh, also consists of countries where there are many dictators at the regime. So this promise needs to be uh, fulfilled. If we want to talk about the real thing, if you have to show your face, if you have to take decisions that are important, without a question, every human right has the human right to be a safe and still people drown in the Mediterranean Sea. There's no question that people who live in Qatar, in Russia or somewhere else where dictators govern the state will have their human rights taken off them. Uh, of course, we cannot go into the countries and um, restore the human rights, but should we do business with them? Should we bow to them? And um, if we, in countries where we know that people are imprisoned, are we prepared to enforce human rights in our own country? For example, non-discrimination. Discrimination is an infringement of human rights. And if I take a look at how uh, in our democracy and in other countries discrimination takes place every day and how little we do against this, I really ask myself, what is the value of the promise? I think 
there's still a lot to be done. Even if we try to convince ourselves that we stand up for human rights, I have to say that double standards are the twin of morals. But we have the counter argument at the, uh, asking uh, the answering the question should we do business with dictatorships that trample upon human rights well then the federal government and all the current one and the ones before would say yes maybe this uh, idea has is uh, being questions a little bit more than before and still we keep doing business with iran and other dictatorship countries you wanted to say two things? No, it, I was just saying, answering this to your second question. I'm a philosopher and not a professional politician, but I have to say I, en I don't envy the ones who have to make the decisions. The task of the professional politician is to balance different perspectives, but also different political needs of a society and a countries, and then in the balancing, finding compromises. I'm a fan of compromises. Who is against compromises will be a leader of a religious sect or will be just an arbitrary person. So if we formulate these things, it has to be clear that the legal basis or the ethical basis has to be founded. It is founded. It is about human rights. And still, I believe that if we depend on dictatorships for mere economic reasons, it is because we have agreed to it too much. We have accepted Putin with his murderous um, acting also at home in Russia. And the LNG terminals will be created in Qatar, where people may not be homosexual, where women's rights are not respected. So there is discrimination taking place in Qatar. So this is why we ask the question whether even against the background of all pragmatism, we just give ourselves up going the economic way. So I think we could be a, could have founded an economically successful society without being so dependent from the dictators and set a sign for this. They are dis dissidents in Russia and in Saudi Arabia, and the whole world passes by them and not only shakes hands with the repressive governments, but they also legitimize the regimes. Also, uh, this is for the people being imprisoned in Turkey and in other countries is a, a statement which is very wrong. And I also have to say this in terms in the, against the perspective of Turkey, all these agreements, also the flee route together with uh, Tunisia or not, I only have to say that we become more dependent dependent from dictatorships that uh, that strangle the population in a political way. And we just do this in order to get a better position that is easier for our democracy. But this is not this is immorality actually because we say or we think at least as long as we don't have the problem anymore and this is not a basis for human rights this is the sheer uh, opposition from your personal perspective living abroad as a human rights activist would you agree with all of this in this clarity well, there are no contradictions, of course. I'm also a historian and not actually a human rights activist. This is partially a different thing, I have to say. But I'm also a person who, ha um, who has um, contradictions in herself. So how about the future of human rights? 
I have worked in such an organization that has dealt with acute human rights violation and also with the working on the truth of historical events, the truth, truthful interpretation. Many things have come up here and we see it every day how uh, history is being instrumentalized, being the object of conflicts and also the basis for conflicts, as we have seen in the Ukraine in a massive way. Putin actually has said there is no independent country of Ukraine. It has always belonged to the Russian Empire. It should just come back, so just put it in plain words here. But what can we do? I have started with that. We are in a position where we know that the organizations that have to advocate human rights seem to fail. And if Russia sits in the Security Council at the United Nations, it is really a ridiculing of human rights. What can we, we do? You ask me. What can we do when you live abroad and so on? Well, first of all, you can document it. As a historian and a human rights activist, I can do this because we were all witnesses. We actually saw it on the one hand. And then secondly, if it really is about a legal sentence here, then it is important to have real proof. It was so difficult, for example, to bring the Serbian Milosevic to the court. How difficult it was to give proof of his crimes. So what we have to do is to collect document. And we do this together with our Ukrainian human rights colleagues. So this is work going on. Of course, there are controversial things in culture, in language between the two nations. But this, this track is working out well because together we document the crimes. And these are thousands and thousands of cases. And we see the means of warfare here and we try to document it. We see uh, terror attacks not only in the Ukraine, but this needs to be documented and be published. The public must know about it. And also this machinery of lies must be fought, which takes place in Russia and is one of the main weapons in the war. And again, also not, not only in Russia, but also very acutely today what happens in Israel. Mr. Friedman, if we agree with the hypothesis that the United Nations, who are actually to deal with human rights, has become almost useless in advocating human rights, how can we actually reestablish a normative order here? When I talk about the United Nations, I have a very ambivalent view. I have to differentiate it, but I am ambi I'm ambiguous about ambivalent. It was founded after the Second World War, after the Shoah, and is actually the, still the first organization where almost all countries of the world come together. And if you think of the 20th century, not to mention the 19th and 18th century, this is a civil, uh, civilian uh, step of progress in itself. No matter which country has caused what, but this is the possibility where all the states, the government representatives, the diplomats come together and talk. This is the positive ambiguity here. And the negative one, if you are prepared to say it is most important that we have a place in order to have political courts, but we accept that there are member states and dictators who actually trample on human rights and they shed blood 
against their own population, they terrorize and torture their own population, that we have to be aware that accepting this has to be the precondition for the first step. But how to um, bear this is a very big challenge here, this ambiguity. And another perspective I would like to offer is that the United Nations were found in a world during the 1940s that in the 21st century has completely changed from a geopolitical point of view. And one of the reproaches uh, I have here for all the member states that from when they do foreign policy and geopolitical policy, they still seem to act as if we were still in the 20th century, as if China is a developing country as if the U.S. will always be the U.S. doing everything for human rights and democracy. And at the same time, we say we don't defend us anymore in Germany. I'm convinced that within the next three to five years, we will be here and say, how is it that we overlooked India? How come? But this international question, of course, India has become a world power. So the UN represent geopolitical shifts uh, anymore. They don't do this. And also the different members of the UN. Well, it was founded when the Soviet Union was uh, a winning nation, a freeing country from the Nazis. This is why the United Nations is, is, um, was fully right to accept the Soviet Union into its uh, circles. And nowadays, Russia has become one of the biggest problems with regard to its imperialism. So as long as the perpetrator can be one of the highest judges, human rights will have no opportunity. So how do you do it? How do you create a new world order? Well, actually, in Germany, we don't have a geopolitical strategy and zero. And this is why this war in Russia against international law and brutal, which started actually in 2014. I keep saying this, the federal, German federal government, the French, and all of them, they just try to dim the light so that we are not blinded by the light, that our view is still clear. And instead of uh, penalties, they and we awarded us oil and gas. We are no single step further here. Why am I saying this? I'm trying to formulate all of these ambiguities of these ambivalences. I, as long as there is no alternative here, because the economic arguments, of course, but the corruption of money is not necessary. But the necessity of diplomacy is still the only option we have for countries fighting each other, that uh, dictatorships uh, have the tool to allow for humanitarian gestures. It, I don't want to uh, over estimate this, but we should not leave it outside completely. Well, leave it out completely, of course not. But, and I have to tell you this, after the times of the Soviet Union, uh, the Soviet Union has uh, won uh, national socialism, but at the cost of uh, high rate of victims. And I think until perestroika, the real numbers were actually disguised, not 7 million, but 20, 28 million victims. And the prob problem was there from the very beginning. 
fascism was, of course, won, but Stalinistic dictatorship didn't give freedom to the countries that were freed. And that was a challenge for the whole of Eastern Europe, which was under the Soviet influence. And we know this. And it was a very strong shift here. And quite often a threat came out of this. The Soviet Union has started wars, the Afghanistan war, and everything else, you name it. There are very important, crucial things that we keep to. It's the General Declaration of Human Rights from 1948, which we adhere to. But I have the feeling, and here I'm following your first question, what people are realizing now, what human rights are. This is what they are more aware of. But there is still the problem. Of course, we can say it three times in a row. They have to be protected. They have to be protected. But it doesn't get any sweeter only if we repeat it. One of the problems in Russia was that Putin, during these more than 20 years of his regime, never ignored. Uh, he always ignored the people. And people didn't know they had their rights. and. Uh, uh, they did not really know that they were in the absolute hands of the state. And the state was able to do what it wanted, the government. It is an eternal tradition in Russia. And I think this was the reason why he has become so successful. The human being and his rights, what to do with it? What do I do with my freedom? It doesn't protect me. So this is at the heart of things. And we see this not only in Russia. It's only an example that I see every day. And we see this development everywhere. Let me add to this. Most people in the world don't even know what we are talking about, about right now. Do we really know this, that they don't know what we are talking about? They never had a single day in their families. They don't have memories in their cultural, um, in their cultural remembrance. What is this rule of law? What is a political free state? And the human being has become an object, and the state has become a subject. Let's take a look at our realities here. And this is what you can say at, in this afternoon at the book fair. The overwhelming majority of people who live in a statal order, and I'm not talking about the ones living in failed states, people. The majority of people don't know what we understand about it. So they cannot reconquer their human rights. But during the last decades, uh, I have seen this, that many people talk about freedom and human rights. But as soon as they are affected by it, that they have to put human rights into practice, and that they might get into a different situation, that is, they have to do without things or other questions will come up, then the, uh, this, it becomes a Sunday preach topic, human rights. And it's not important anymore. Many political decisions are um, sort of affirmed with the argument that we are not able to do things that we just cannot do it. But the human rights are permanently put at disposition. So how can we be taken seriously by dictators? What moral category is fulfilled? Just because we three people sit here, do we need a fourth person sitting here, president, a prime minister, federal chancellor? Yeah, we asked them all to come up here, but they have declined. So do, don't they have to be here in order to state that they do real policy and not pragmatic policy? 
and it means to be pragmatic means somehow I just have to get it done. The whole world needs to be fixed with this. Of course, maybe this is right, but please bear in mind that the UN Human Rights Convention, the EU Charta, is starting from human rights points of view. And the moment we have signed them, they are not at disposition, at the free disposition anymore. And we violate them more often than not, and we don't tell ourselves the truth about it. So one of the constitutional features of the human rights are, is their universal, uh, universal ground. And when you said so many people have never seen that human rights were advocated for them, can we ask the question then whether human rights can be there without being universal? Can they be there? Well, of course, you can think everything, but this is like regressing three to 400 years. What is at the core of human rights? Every person, and I said this before, every person is has the rights just because he or she is a human being. And it's not more about it. Human beings are human beings, and the moment we have agreed upon this, we either have the same basic human rights or we just fall back into racism, into narrative of precious and non-precious lives, all these things that have belonged for longer to humanity, to religion, and for centuries these narratives have grown, also in nationalism. But human rights have tried to cancel this and, uh, well, try to retouch this by saying human rights are human rights. They cannot be discussed. They are non-debatable. No matter what religion or education you have, as soon as you are born, you have human rights. And this makes it all very complex and complicated. When we are here and say, I don't care about the people who are 10,000 kilometers distant, of course, us here in this room, we know we have our human rights, we respect each other. But the further away the problems arise, then we don't uh, care so much anymore. But as soon as my flat is concerned, my commitment or my work, then they also dissolve quickly the human rights. But it does not change anything. We must not be discouraged. From my life, I have to tell you, it makes me feel sick to have to speak about this for decades, to commit myself to this. And I just feel sick to keep repeating this. It is an existential thing. A person that has to die because human rights are not implemented, this makes me feel sick. But this is a process of hundreds of years. And maybe it takes even longer, but we must not give in here. I never want to um, have to say this. One last statement. This idea has got something to do with our capacity of being empathic. We have to be able to understand if we don't, it's not just about help, but it's the other person's right that we implement it. We can be in the same position in a couple of years ourselves. It must be possible that even if I live in a society where people get along quite well, not only from a material point of view, but do we really think 
that within the next 30 or 40 years, it is not possible that there will be maybe a war in or against Germany. Is it not the case that it may be possible that bearing the right-wing extremist political party AFD in Germany, there might be auto an autocratic regime here? Can it not be that um, human rights are valid? Um, and still people don't want to help us, but that we expect people will help us. People take it seriously because we have the same human rights as them. Do we really think this? Mrs. Shabakova. Well, it's difficult to add something to this. I'm. I'm uh, not trying to be hopeful here, but I have certain worries, and we are strongly confronted with the fact that actually for the protection of human rights, simple solutions are offered, like populism does, from both from the left and right wing. And we say this is the simple person from the streets. The person is scared, so it is policy making. It is the lying press and everyday concerns and injustice. We, the populace, we have the solution for you. Very simple solutions. You just follow us. That's what Putin did, and he promised this literally to the people very quickly after he uh, came to power. And we are seeing the results nowadays. And it does not only apply to Russia. I lived in Thuringia for a year in the east of Germany. And I know how populism becomes more and more credible to the people. And from my point of view, this is really dangerous. We have to unite here. And this is my last sentence. The events of the past years have shown us certain things. And we see this nowadays. It does not mean that we can try to get out of this, that we can encapsulate ourselves. No matter if there's a regional war in uh, Ukraine or in Russia, it's not our war. We are so tired of it. Why would we support it all? We have our own worries, and not only our own worries, but this is just an example, of course. But we see that if somewhere in the world human rights are trampled upon in such a way, it's like a chain reaction. The sheer existence of Putin-like regime is an option for the other to feel even stronger. And I am absolutely warning against this. It all, it affects us all, it affects us all. Can I just add the so-called simple person from the street? This is always the narrative to explain how and why populism works. May I remind that in Germany and where other elsewhere where there are populist uh, trends, the educated civilians are there with their fear of loss. Well, if you lose 1,800 euros net a month, actually, you don't really have uh, to lose a lot. But if you have if you have a very low standard of living, you are scared. And this is triggered by the populace. In Germany, it was not a bald head with um, Springer uh, shoes, but the person was Professor Sarrazin from the SPD, from the Social uh, Democrats, an ex-member. So it was not just 
Nazi thinking. But we saw, I think in 2007, that you were right into German um, civilization that were educated people, people with a PhD, whatever it means in this context, who say in America, and Trump says it, I am a part of you, I belong to you, but they are so distant from them like the ones they fight against. And let me say something very personal here. It's a human right that a human in his or her home country can go everywhere. I have to tell you that not only since today, I myself as a Jew, also against the background of the anti, um, of the representative of the federal government against Semitism, that I should not be on the streets everywhere, every time in Germany as a Jew. But what does it mean if I still want to go there? Is it then my own fault if something happens to me? And with all the protests, and I'm not judging here about Israel and so on, but the information by the German security authorities People said, please don't uh, swing the big f Jewish uh, flag, so to speak. Don't show Jewish uh, symbols. Well, they never said this to the Palestine uh, people in, living in Germany. If I meet, I myself, if I meet a people from uh, Palestinian, I'd, I'm not having aggressions here, and I'm not, I, I don't feel that the person feels threatened by myself. But if I, um, as a Palestinian, I don't have problems in Eastern Germany, but being a black person or a Jewish person, I have problems in certain areas. I cannot go for a simple relaxed walk. And this is a problem of human rights. I have the human rights. How do we deal with this problem? How do children deal with this problem? Human identity has to be protected, of course. And how do we deal with the fact that the politicians tell us, please don't provoke, please don't provoke the ones who feel aggressive against you? How do I do this? Do I go into the ghetto? Do I move only uh, with my back to the wall very slowly and quietly? Make sure that the David star does not fall out of your bags or whatever. Isn't this a little too much to ask? And again, this also applies to black people in other countries. It applies to uh, transgender people. So how can we talk about human rights and discuss them where the macro circumstances don't show empathy? And how can you take me seriously as a European? If Mr. Orban meets Putin in Beijing, takes nice pictures, but the European Union says human rights belong to the EU Charter, Charter, sorry. How do we do this? How do we do this without losing ourselves? And these contradictions have to be uh, named and stated. What is our orientation? It's not our opinion, but our uh, attitude. It's our point of view. And if you check how reality is, well, of course, I don't live always up to my principles. On the contrary, I have violated my principles many times, and I feel embarrassed about this. But if possible, if ever, I want to be able to return to my principles. And how do we behave as human beings, as a nation state? Maybe a little bit of self-criticism is uh, useful here. Maybe then we will start and defend human rights because they are worth it. And this is, I, I'll keep up this point of view. Irina Sherbakova, Michelle Friedman, thank you so much for addressing exactly these things. And this 
what is in between the lines. Of course, like always, time is never enough, but I would like to thank you out of my heart for being here, and I would like to thank the audience. So, check, check. Hallo, nochmal einmal ans Mic. Check, check, check. Ja, ein herzliches Dankeschön nochmal an Frau Professor Irina Shevakova, Professor Dr. Dr. Michel Friedmann, Louis. A big thank you go again to Professor Friedmann, Professor Shevakova, and also to Louis Klamroth, the host. We have talked about these things that are difficult to treat and difficult to analyze. And I thought maybe we can end on a more positive note. But it's actually not the time. It is a more reflective note we are ending on. And I would like to thank all of those who have participated for more than three hours. It was a very ambitious program. Thank you for being here. And I hope that you will have a nice evening. Please be so kind as to leave the room now because we have to make rearrangements here. I'm happy to see you here tomorrow again. Thank you again for your attention.